So last class, I think I was not being careful enough with my presentation and with my language, and I think I might have given you guys the wrong idea about what power is. If you look at the readings, um, you'll see exactly the right definition, so I want to clear that up before we get started. So if you think about um, the test that we're running, we typically have some null hypothesis. I'll label this null. Some rejection regions, I'll make this two-tailed just for simplicity. And then we have the data that we actually observe. So these are our observations. And this is related to the alternative. And we can make a couple different types of errors. So an alpha error occurs when, so when, we incorrectly reject the null. And the probability of an alpha, alpha error, so I'm going to say P, P represents probability of an alpha error, is just whatever alpha value that people set. The other type of error is when we incorrectly fail to reject the null. And this is beta. Power, well, so the probability of beta this is going to depend on a whole lot of things. All the things that we talked about last class. Sample size is bigger, then the beta is going to be smaller. We use a paired design instead of an independent design, beta is going to be smaller. Now power, power isn't when we do something wrong. Power is when we do something right. And specifically power is when we correctly Uh, when we correctly reject the null. And the probability of power is just equal to 1 minus the probability of making a beta error. Sorry, which should be beta, not b. If you think about probabilities, um, one of the things that I talk about in the readings but didn't discuss so much in the class, sorry, let me get out of your way, is that, um, maybe I'll hold on and let you guys write this down for a sec. While you're writing, I'm going to write something else. What's the maximum probability that you can ever observe? It's one. It's one, right? There's a hundred percent chance of something of something of something happening. The probability is one that that thing will happen. Now there are different things that can happen, and we can talk about the things that can happen in terms of whether those things are mutually exclusive and whether or not they're exhaustive. So when two things are mutually exclusive, that means you can have one or you can have the other, but you'll never have both. So if you think about flipping a coin, you can have a heads or you can have a tails, but you can never have both, right, on any single coin flip. So heads and tails are mutually exclusive options. They're also exhaustive options. So if something or if a set of things are ex exhaustive, that means it exhausts all of the potential possibilities that could happen, right? So if we're flipping a coin, we can get heads, we can get tails, there's nothing else that we can get. Imagine the situation on the off chance that it landed up, we'd just say screw that and we'd flip it again, right? So we're only going to get heads or tails. So those events, they are both mutually exclusive because if we have a heads, we can never get a tails. And they're exhausted because those are the only two possible things that will happen. 
When we have a set of events that is mutually exclusive and exhaustive, the probabilities for all of the different events must add up to one. So if you think about when we're talking about just flipping a coin one time, what it, if the coin was fair, what's the probability that it's heads? 0.5. What's the probability that it's tails? 0.5. If you add up the probability of heads and the probability of tails, what do you get? One. Right? So they are mutually exclusive, exhaustive possibilities. So the probability of those different outcomes have to add up to one. So this, the probability of power, right? So I said it's 1 minus the probability of uh, beta. If we think about this distribution, our observations, everything over here, this is our power. Everything over here, this is our beta. Let's see. When we incorrectly fail to reject the null, notice this is our criterion. So this little section over here is when this is true, when the alternative is true, given the mean that we actually observed. And this little bit in here would indicate when we would fail to reject the null. So in this situation, we are incorrectly failing to reject the null if the alternative were true. Here, all of this is when we correctly reject the null. So this is beyond the criterion, so we're going to reject. So all of this stuff in here is when we correctly reject the null. And these two things, because everything is covered, either in this tail that goes off here, or in this tail that goes off here, since everything is in there, probability has to equal one. So the thing that I think I might have gotten you guys confused about is not that power is this. This is the probability of a type two error, and it's related to power. Does that make sense? Okay, so what questions have you for me? Isn't everything mutually exclusive and exhaustive? No, not necessarily. Um, what's your major? Psych. What's your major? Psych. Okay, imagine we have a more diverse class, <laughs> okay? And I ask someone what their major is, and they say business. Right? Some business majors take psych classes. If this were an intro class, that would probably be much more likely to happen. So you can think, let me <laughs> uh, show you guys something else. And hopefully some of you guys will be familiar with this. This is not what I intended to teach about today. But it will be useful for understanding what I'm talking about. So I'm going to show you a Venn diagram. In a Venn diagram, basically everything that's in this box is possible. And the probability of something happening in this box is, or of the probability of one thing from that box happening is going to be equal to one. So imagine I sample my intro to psychology class, and I have some number of psychology majors. So the total like proportion of psych majors that I have is represented by the size of the circle. Now, the question is, what about business majors? Would business majors look like this? Or could we have something like this? Have you met any double majors? Some that are majoring in business and psychology? Maybe not business and psychology, maybe sociology and psychology? So a lot of times people think about majors as being like, oh, you're this or that, but you can be both. Does that make sense? So in the simple heads, tails example, you can have both. But there are other things that you can be both. So think about this as being, um, let's divide this. Do you know if there are more males or females here at Eastern? Or is it roughly the same? I'm just going to throw this down the middle. So let's say we've got about half that identify as male and half that identify as female. Where do the student athletes go? And here's somewhere. There are going to be some males that are student athletes and some males that are not student athletes. So those type of events are not mutually exclusive. Okay? 
We're not going to get into all the crazy probability stuff. Because believe me, there's crazy probability stuff that goes well beyond this. Like, what's the probability given that you're female, that you're a student athlete? And how does that relate to the probability that you're a student? We're not going to bother with that here. You can learn about that in stats. Does that answer your question? Exhaustive. So exhaustive means that the set of whatever we're talking about is completely exhaustive. It, the, the final word with the word. Great job, William. So if things are exhaustive, that means that they completely cover any situation that could occur. So when we did the whole, like we've got three coin flips. We can have a head, a head, and a head, a head, and a head, and a tail, and all of that stuff. What we did when we indicated all of the possible outcomes, we covered the outcomes exhaustively. Here are all the potential situations um, that you could observe when you flip the coin three times. So here's another good example of the difference between exhaustive and mutually exclusive. So depending on how you're thinking about problems, these are mutually exclusive options or not. So there's only one way that you can observe a head, a head, and then a tail. But there are two ways that you can observe one tail. Actually, there are more ways, right? Because you can also get a tail, a head, and a head. So these all fit into a single tail, even though individually they each describe a single outcome. Does that help there? Leah. Bad boy. You're just stuck on the sidewalk. I've started calling my daughter Ahsoka. I've never actually seen Star Wars. Clone Wars. Oh, okay. Don't bother Star Wars. Your mom was Princess Leia for Halloween, right? I wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Now you already have some. Yes, let's go over the t-test. What aspects of the t-test do you want to go over? Uh, the definition of, of each one and how they are not at all to each other. Like, so the like difference is between a one and a one and a one and a one Okay. Thank you, Ken. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so let's do this. So we'll do one sample. We'll do independent, and we'll do paired. Another way that we could refer to paired is dependent, because one sample depends on the other. So if we're going to compare, let's, I don't want to just say how they're um, different from one another, because there may be a question that asks you how they're similar to one another. So let's ask questions about types of research designs between slash within. So in what situations would we use the one sample independent and paired t-tests? If we're thinking about research designs that are between subjects or within. Paired is within. Independent is between. Uh, 
How about one? So both between and within suggests that there's something different between the groups, right? And with a one sample, how many samples do we have? We've got one sample, so it really doesn't apply to between or within because there is no manipulation that we're comparing things to. So out of this, independent is absolutely right. And we can think about this if we have um, participants, something that is varying between participants, then we could have an independent sample, right? So I take one group of participants, actually I take an entire group of people and then randomly assign one group of people to one condition and randomly assign a group of people to another condition, right? So in that situation, that could clearly be uh, between subjects manipulation. How about with paired? So with paired, absolutely, within is a possibility, right? This would be like a within, that would be I'm doing one condition and then I'm doing a different condition. You guys know about the Stroop effect? So the Stroop effect, who knows? Something that almost all interest set classes cover. So you're given a word and you're asked to identify the color that the word is written. So you get something like red, blue. Blue is the correct answer. It's written in the color blue. And this is a task that's kind of hard. And we could compare situations where we have a mismatch between the color of the word and the name of the word, or we could have something where the color of the word and the name are consistent with one another, right? So I could do both of these situations. I could read a whole bunch of words, some of which would be the same color and some of which would be different colors than the actual names of the words. And by participating in both of those conditions, you can look and see how fast I am on average to do both of those types of tasks. So that's a situation where you are doing a within subjects manipulation, right? Each participant is participating in the different levels that you're interested in looking at. However, it doesn't have to be completely with it. So paired, it could be between or with it. How could it be between? So imagine the situation when we were talking about exam performance and intelligence. And you take the two smartest people and you randomly assign one to one and the other to the other. Right? Now what you have, you've paired people up, right? The samples are no longer independent. They are dependent on one another. So we have paired people, but still we're looking at something between participants. So what would be a good exam question to try to figure out the difference between independent and paired? If I want to see if you really understood. If you think of exam questions, you're engaging in processing similar to the processing I'm doing when I think of exam questions, you're more likely to figure out what I'm going to ask. I had one student in an intro class, he was uh, brilliant, he's a pilot now, and uh, what he did is he basically created um, tests. They were a form of interactive PowerPoint tests. Um, but he created the test based on questions I'd asked in class and study guides and readings and stuff, and then he sold them to his peers. And he and the people who bought his tests ended up doing better on my test than those who did not. So, if you think of a question that would be good, that would be useful. If we're using a t-test and we have a within subject manipulation, what type of t-test do we have to use? Paired. Paired. Right? If I ask you something about between, hopefully there would be an answer like either independent or paired. Does that make sense? Okay, 
So what other things? Think about the type of data. If we're using any of the two types, what type of data should we have? Ordinal, ratio, interval, or, oh, I did it. <laughs> or not. There we go. What type of data are we talking about when we talk about exam scores? or about IQ scores. We want to see if this group of students who were in a Montessori school are different than students who were in a public school. We're going to look at their IQs. Interval or, no, not nominal. Or ratio, right? And that's the dependent variable. So the dependent variable, so let's put DV, the dependent variable data type for all of these. It should be interval, interval, or ratio. How about number of samples? What's the duh answer for a one sample? One. How about independent? How many samples do we have? Two. How about pair? Two. Yep. Speaking of two, I want to now take a look at what she said just a minute ago, and she said nominal. So if the independent variable is nominal, that's just fine. We can compare students who had Montessori versus students that were in public school. That's a nominal scale variable, the type of school that you went to. We can compare those students just fine. We can also compare students on something else, like a ratio scale variable for 0 milligrams of caffeine and 100 milligrams of caffeine. Now that's a ratio scale. 0 milligrams means that there is none. So we have a meaningful 0. And the difference between 10 and 20 is the same as the difference between 90 and 100, right? Both 10 milligrams. So that's a ratio scale variable. However, when we are doing that, we just have two levels of the variable. So my control group, they all get nothing. My experimental group, they all get 100. Right? So we just have two levels. If we didn't have two levels, we had, let's say I was uh, going to see, I don't know, whatever the dependent variable would be based on the amount of caffeine that you've already consumed this morning, and I account for coffee and Red Bulls and, and whatever else that you're drinking. What should I do instead of a t-test? Not an ANOVA. An ANOVA is used in situations that are very similar to t-tests. In fact, anytime you have a, a t-test with two samples, you can run an ANOVA. So with an ANOVA, again, you have discrete categories. Maybe 0 milligrams, 100 milligrams, and 200 milligrams. Nothing in between. But what, I mean, if I was asking you guys how much caffeine that you had this morning and I was measuring, he may have had zero, she may have had 23, she may have 245, right? So if I want to see if there's a relationship between uh, amount of caffeine and, let's say, test scores, what would be better to use than a t-test or an ANOVA? Because I don't have those discrete levels. I've already covered this, although I haven't described how to do the tests. What statistic do we use to learn about relationships? Is all of them? Well, not all of them, but we want to see whether two things co-relate. Co-variance. Co. -variance. co Correlation. Correlation. Yeah, correlation. Which is based on the covariance, so good job. Other things. Let's say power Q. 
to distinguish between two groups. So let's forget about one sample for a moment. Which is going to be the more powerful test? Pair. More. Less. Yes, it's right. Why is the paired more powerful? Wouldn't it be the paired within them? Actually, both are going to be more powerful than the independent. Because if we're pairing people, regardless of whether we're doing between, we're still matching people on some extraneous variable, right? Now, if we think about the difference between paired within and paired between, which would be more powerful? Within, yes, because the within, we're going to be pairing people on everything that goes with being them. Their gender, their religious affiliation, the number of siblings that they have, whether or not their parents were divorced, all of these things are going to be the same within them. So all of those extraneous variables that could potentially push things up or down are going to be identical for an individual person. So basically that gets rid of a whole lot more error variance than the between situation. But that between situation is still more powerful than the independent. Because when we have the independent t-test and we're looking to see how people perform, I really don't know who the two smartest people are. And because I don't know who the two smartest people are, I can't compare performance between those two smartest and then the performance of the next two smartest. I don't have that information, so I can't pair that up. When I can pair that up by looking at, ooh, let's go into another thing, by looking at the differences between those pairs, I'm basically looking at differences in performance where we've controlled for that paired extraneous variable or the paired extraneous variables. So if we do this again in one sample, independent and paired. So, uh, what are we comparing? So in a one sample t-test, what are we comparing? Think about the null hypothesis. Uh, so we're comparing one sample, particularly the mean, to a particular amount. To amount. What are we comparing in an independent t-test? One sample to another sample. So x1 and x2, the means of those, right? So here we are looking for a difference between means. And what are we looking at in a paired t-test? Same thing? For one to another. So before to the after? The so before like, to the after. Then it comes to y to so what? No, that's um, the difference. The means of the difference, it's right. So here in the independent situation we have a difference between means. Here we have a mean of the differences. These values will actually give us exactly the same thing. The mean of the differences is the same thing as the difference of the means. What's different about these is what happens to the standard error of the mean. So if you think about our distributions, right, we have some distributions. And if, let's say, we've got some distribution that looks like that, part of the reason that we have the variations for our most recent example is because there are differences in IQs. So people with higher IQs will go up, people with lower IQs will go down. However, by pairing people for IQ, or by pairing them for a whole lot of things when we do a within subject manipulation, what we're doing is we're basically looking at performance after we've accounted for those differences in IQs, which will mean that this standard error of the means is much smaller. So if you remember, all of our t-tests have something 
where we have the standard error of the means on the bottom. So when we use a paired t-test, what's happening is we have a much smaller standard, or we should have a much smaller um, standard error of the mean if the extraneous variable that we pair people on actually affects the dependent variable. If it doesn't, then we shouldn't be doing this. However, so the smaller that the standard error of the mean is, the bigger that t is. And the bigger that t is, the more power we have. So, size of sim, standard error of the means. So the one sample and the independent samples, let's just say that whatever they are, so normal sim, because we're including all of the things that could potentially affect the dependent variable. And here with the paired, by getting rid of that extraneous variable or extraneous variables in the within situation, we have a much smaller set. So this is going to mean more power, smaller beta. Speaking of sims, what do the sims look like? And also, what does n mean? So the sims, all of them, let's express them all as square roots of ratios. So what goes on top and what goes on bottom? goes on bottom for all of them. N. N goes on bottom. Okay, so let's address this N question right now. What does N actually represent in these different situations? the number of observations of the x's that you have, right? So n is number of x observations. Same thing here. And what is it over here? Because this n is different. It's not the mean. So n has to do with number, but it's not just the number of observations that we have. If I have 10 students and I measure them twice, I would have 20 observations. But what am I actually looking at? I'm looking at differences. How many differences do I have? 10. So it's not the number of observations total, it's the number of differences. I'll write the number symbol here. Okay, there's one thing that's standing out to me as odd. Independent. It should really look like this, right? Something like that. We have two different x's, so we have the number of x1 observations and the number of x2 observations. X, I'm using X1 and X2 instead of X and Y because X indicates that it's the same variable that we're actually measuring, right? We're interested in looking at playground violence before and after. Or at one school with the intervention and at other schools without the intervention. So we're looking at the same variable, number of violent outbreaks or something like that, right? But we have two different situations, two different conditions, right? Because we've got two samples here. One N has to do with the number of uh, uh, violent outbreaks we had in the school with the intervention, or schools, and the other one would be the number of violent outbreaks in the control space, right? So would it be what? 
x1, well, not y, because y suggests it's a different variable, right? x1, x2, close, closer. So what goes in the numerator? It's not x1 and x2. It's related to x1 and x2. S1. Wait, numerator? I'm just kidding. S1, S2, what else? Nope. Squared. Right? If we re express this, like some of these we've written as not sigma, but s over square root of n. So if this is equal to that, what must be here? S squared. Yes. And how about here? Just like n represents the number of difference, what does the s here represent? Right? The, f, the s's here all indicate the variance of our observations. But here, this isn't the variance of our observations. It's the variance of, of the differences. That's right. All right, did make that obvious. That's it. All of these are basically, I mean, identical to one another. In, Form broadly considered, right? They all have a square root. We all have ends on the bottom, and we all have variances on top. The variances are different because we have two samples here. We've got both of them in there, but basically they're all very, very similar. I think that should cover different types of t-tests. Anything else? to erase this. Okay, quiz time. We increase alpha. What happens to power? As we increase alpha, we increase the power. That's exactly right. As we decrease sample size, what happens to power? Right, power drops down when we have a smaller sample size. When we have a smaller sample size, what happens to the standard error of the mean? Yes, yeah. The standard error of the mean is bigger with a smaller sample size. Remember, the larger our sample size, the more the standard error of the mean gets pulled in. And the more that that gets pulled in, the farther away this criterion gets from whatever you know, observation that we actually have, if that observation is on that side. Uh, when we do a paired t-test, what happens to our standard error of the means as opposed to independent? Paired t-test, smaller standard error of the means, which means what about power? More power. What's the only thing that affects alpha error rate? Yeah. Experiment. The experiment. Um, in what type of research design do you measure individuals of different ages and then follow them across time? One to two. Not cross-sectional, not longitudinal. It mixes components of both of those. You have a cross-sectional component. You also have a longitudinal component. Cohort, cohort what? Yes, that's the right first syllable. Or the right first phoneme, sorry, it's not quite a syllable by itself. 
Yes, co-consequential. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, what is a p-value? Or define a p-value. Probability of something occurring by coincidence. Probability of something occurring by coincidence. Or by chance, that's fine, but you could make it better. Who's got a better definition? And by fine, I mean like that's a fine start. Like that would not be the right answer. That is more extreme than the value of chance. That was fast. Can you say that again? I was just going from what she had said, and then I said as or more extreme than the value of chance. A probability of observing something as or more extreme than what you found. Chance. Your chance. Perfect. Perfect. That's exactly. What's the traditional alpha level? Huh? 0.05. What do we do when uh, P is equal to 0.05? Reject. Fail to reject. We fail to reject. <clears throat> We reject. So, when I've written it up, lots of times you see just P is less than 0.05, but the criterion is P is less than or equal to 0.05. This means if it's less than 0.05, we reject. If it's equal to 0.05, we also reject. If we reject the null accidentally, what type, or not accidentally, it's not an accident, but incorrectly. This means the null is true, but we rejected it anyway based on the evidence that we had. What type of error did we make? Uh, so we rejected it. Or wait, I said we failed it. What did I say? I thought you said reject it when it was true. When we incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. That means there is nothing there, but you said that there was something there. Is that a miss? When you miss something, that's when you say that there's nothing there, but there really is. It's a two error. Two error, right? So we said that we're going to reject the null, but we shouldn't have. We incorrectly did it, that's a type two error. And the opposite of a type two error is Power. I thought that's what you meant. No, we said type one. <laughs> huh? Okay. Well, that's another way. I mean, so I guess it depends on what way you're thinking about opposite, right? In terms of probability, remember how we had the beta is the type two error, and the rest of that, the opposite of that, is power. But if you're considering the different types of error, and one error is the opposite of the other then yes, you are right, and if you argued that on a test question that you got wrong, I would probably give you credit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You are in the way today.